This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Dr. David D. Friedman, an American economist, physicist, legal scholar, and libertarian theorist. He is the son of Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman. Dr. Friedman is well known for his most popular book on microeconomics and the libertarian theory of anarcho-capitalism, the machinery of freedom. Doug and Dr. Friedman chat about anonymous digital cash, David's and his father's prediction of its birth, whether cryptocurrency can be sound money, and the libertarian perspective on today's most pressing current events. Monero Talk starts now. My question for you was, was I correct in believing that neither Monero nor the other digital currency that's trying to be anonymous is really fully anonymous? That is to say that a a bad guy willing to invest enough time and energy watching things can eventually deduce who you are. Is that a correct statement? Because I was told uh, that by someone. Yeah, else. so I think that that's a debatable statement. I think basically what it is is, um, yeah, nobody's figured out how to make perfect uh, you know, a perfect version of digital cash that can't be uh, unraveled in, in some respect. But Monero seems to be the closest thing to that. And then what I think what separates Monero from the others is this realization of that and this culture among the Monero community that it's always a continuous battle and that it's always iterating to fight that battle. So I guess from my standpoint, my two reservations about digital currency at the moment are one of them is that one that is how anonymous you can make it and the other is that as far as i can tell there is no digital currency yet which is really as convenient to use as paying with a credit card or paypal for example and in fact i believe that paypal was originally intended to be an anonymous system that i remember uh, a talk by and talking with one of the people involved a very long time ago, back when they were talking about doing it uh, using Palm Pilots, I think, using some sort of a, 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 a handheld device. And the idea was a way of making it possible for people in the third world, say, who wanted to get income that was not observable to those around them and make transactions to do it. And as far as I can tell, PayPal eventually gave up on that project and was very successful in a somewhat different project. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I guess what, what differentiates something like Monero or, or Zcash or Bitcoin from PayPal, the biggest difference being that, uh, you know, PayPal is centralized uh, and these yeah. systems are decentralized. Yeah. And not con controlled that's by any that's also a, a closer analogy, what distinguishes it from Xiaomi and digital cash. That is to say, I think it's the case that Xiaomi, Xiaomi and digital cash really was secure. Uh, I believe it's the case that there was no way of, of determining who, who made what payment, even if you could observe all transactions, as long as you couldn't see who was actually sending a, an email. And the problem with ta Xiaomi and digital cash, which was a wonderful idea, was that it required an issuer. It required a bank. And that bank had to be located in some sufficiently reputable place so people trusted it. But all such reputable places have governments. Uh, governments don't want an anonymous digital cash since that makes money laundering laws unenforceable. And consequently, it never came into existence. And what I thought was really brilliant about Bitcoin was that they had managed to create a digital currency that required no issuer. Correct. They decentralized. That was a very clever idea. Uh, the other thing that would be nice, though it's not essential, would be a digital cash that you could set up so that it was using one of the standard units, dollars or euros or pounds. Uh, and there are certainly ways of doing that. The I've sketched, I think, on my blog once uh, a imaginary system uh, which would give you a digital cash 
which maintained a very close to one to one exchange rate with the dollar if you wanted to set it up that way. Uh, and I don't know if there are any at the moment that do that, but that, that would be yeah, nice. There are, there are a lot of attempts at that, but it's it's pretty it's very difficult to do that once again without having this kind of centralized component. Well, I can tell you how to do it, mm -hmm. and my method is not exactly centralized. There is some fixed number of of, of uh, rights holders, as it were, uh, but as a transferable right. Uh, and my system is that you have, say, ten individuals, firms doesn't much matter, uh, and the system is set up. So that any time the you you also need to have an oracle. You need to have some way of seeing what the exchange rate is, uh, and I'm sure you know it more about oracles than I do. But uh, I had a a a car trip from I think Graz, Austria to Budapest with a bunch of the people associated with one of your competitors, uh, in which they explained that stuff to me, and I thought again it was very clever. I like clever things, uh, and that my scheme is uh, anytime the exchange the exchange value of your currency is above one for one with the dollar, one of the set of issuers is allowed to issue one coin and it goes in a circle so that uh, whoever is the next one gets to issue it. Anytime it goes below one dollar, the next one in the in the circle is obligated to burn a coin. If he doesn't burn a coin, he now loses his right to issue. Uh, and as far as I know, all of that could be set up in software in a fairly straightforward fashion. The right to be one of these people is going to be private code, public code kind of system. You can transfer it to someone else if you like. Uh, and it seems to me that that's a system where unless there's reason to expect the price of the currency to crash, if you expect it to be below one dollar for a long time, then nobody's going to burn coins because it's not the right the issue isn't worth anything. But as long as you've got a currency that's sufficiently convenient so that it's going to tend to drift up, not down. Now, that seems to me to be a mechanism that gives you one to one. Am I missing something? Uh, it's hard for me to say offhand if, if that if that would work, if that would uh, solve the problem. Um, but let's I just want to back up for a second. Sure, so, of course. so for the audience that will be tuning in. So your father, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, among many things, essentially predicted something like Bitcoin or Monero. Uh, That's not really a fair statement. In the 90s. Uh, well, how would, you, how would you characterize it? Oh, sure. I, I got interested in public key encryption and along with that anonymous digital cash very early. I certainly talked about it to my father, who thought it was interesting. But as far as I can remember, neither of us was talking about the Bitcoin idea that the Bitcoin idea depends, as you were saying, on it being a fully decentralized system. And I think we were thinking in terms of Xiaomi and digital cash, which is a fully anonymous form of digital cash, but requires an issuer. And mm. as I was just saying, there's a reason why that hasn't happened. And it's possible that it will happen. It's possible that at some point there will be a some, some environment, a uh, state or something else, where you have firms sufficiently trusted so that you could have a bank issuing Xiaomi and digital cash there. And once you've got that, the bank itself doesn't know who makes the transactions. I'm, I assume you're familiar with Xiaomi's system. Uh, I should say I have in my book, uh, Future Imperfect, a low tech version of Xiaomi and digital cash. That is to say one which does not involve encryption and all the rest of it. And it would be very clumsy to use, but it, you might want to look at that because it's useful for explaining to people how it's logically possible to have a way in which I can make a payment to you where I don't have to know who you are. You don't have to know who I am in the bank. It doesn't have to know who either of us is and never does because mm -hmm. mine is a much simpler way than Jones is. Uh, but in any case, so I think the answer is that pro I, I suspect my father at some point was talking about the idea of anonymous digital cash. He almost certainly got that from me since that was something I was very interested in, but not as far as I know. I can't remember anything either of us was saying before Bitcoin existed that would have countered as a prediction of Bitcoin. Well, well now that this, this decentralized technology does exist, that breakthrough yes. did happen, the Byzantine general's problem was essentially solved with the creation yes. of Bitcoin. What, what is your take on that? I mean, so, what, what do you what do you think about these decentralized currencies that aren't controlled by anybody? 
are, are, are these effectively a good thing, a bad thing, or well, they're a good matter? thing. The market will figure it out. They're a good thing, but they aren't yet a good enough thing. That is to say, as far as I can tell, there isn't much reason for non-enthusiasts to use them for actual payments. That I've got Bitcoin. Uh, the reason I have Bitcoin is that some years ago, I spoke at Porkfest. I don't know if you're familiar with Porkfest, but that's yeah. the Free State Project in New Hampshire. They have two annual events. I've spoken at both of them. And the outdoor one, which is more fun, is called Porkfest. And they had agreed to pay my expenses. And so I arranged to have them pay my expenses in Bitcoin just for the fun of owning Bitcoin, since I thought Bitcoin was a neat idea. I've held on to it. And so I suppose, I don't know what the present exchange rate is, but my guess is that a few hundred dollars in expenses are probably something in like five or $10,000 now. So it's not a huge amount, but it was a, certainly a profitable decision, but I did it for the fun of it. So anyway, so I've got Bitcoin. I think I may have made payments in Bitcoin once or twice, but as a practical matter, I just hold on to it. That it's, and that's true. Uh, I think I've got one or two other digital currencies, uh, but uh, but again, I don't interact because, again, I gave talks in, in Budapest and there are people in Budapest who are competitors of yours with a different digital currency and they paid me in that. So, so, but, but at this point, as far as I can tell, it's still not really convenient enough so that unless you have some strong reason to want secrecy so that people actually are using it. And that would be very nice if it, if it really became sort of a standard international money in the sense in which dollars are and pounds used to be and and gold used to be if you go back well byzantine uh the byzantine numisma or the arabic dinar were essentially international currencies but at this point i think you i don't know exactly what you have to do i'm not involved with doing this stuff but i think you have to make it enough more convenient uh and the ideal form would be one that was very easy to do and it isn't essential to have a fixed exchange rate to the dollar because one of the points I also make in Future Imperfect is that arguably Europe managed to standardize on a single currency just as it became unnecessary because the problem with multiple currencies is you have to do conversions, but conversions are arithmetic and computers do arithmetic fast and cheap. So it, in the world as it now is, I can put my credit card into a money machine in Europe and draw euros out of a dollar account. Ditto for any, essentially any, any likely currency. Uh, so, and, and similarly, I mean, you, you can buy. So at this point, enough stuff is being done through computers. So it's not really essential. And if, if, if you had a digital currency, most people don't hold a very large part of their wealth as cash. So if, I've got a small part of my wealth is cashed and it's true. It goes up and down sort of randomly, but that doesn't matter very much. So it's really a matter of convenience, but I think you do have to have a way of doing it. It'd be nice if it was, if it was uh, anonymous or close to anonymous, but it would also be nice if it was no trouble to use. And I don't think that's happened yet. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I think, I think we're getting there. We certainly made a lot of progress. Now about the fact that it's, it's sound money. So that, that, that's what a lot of people would say is the first well, use case. I don't know what it is. It isn't sound money. It, it's money that governments can't control, mm -hmm. but it, it's money it, that nobody can control. That's right. right. But that doesn't mean it's sound because it is still going to change its value in a more or less unpredictable way. Would you consider uh, gold sound, sound money or what's your opinion there? Not necessarily gold. Uh, the, the, the value, what, what, I remember my father used to say that William Jennings Bryan was killed by cyanide, politically speaking, because Bryan's central issue was wanting to switch from gold to silver for the monetary standard. The reason that was an issue was that when he started doing it, the value of gold had been going up because there were not very large supplies of gold. The world economy was growing and more countries were going on the gold standard. And that meant that farmers who had debts that were fixed in nominal terms in a gold standard system, the real amount they owed was going up and they didn't like that naturally enough. And that's, and that was a result of gold. It was a result of the fact that gold was not a stable money. 
What then happens is the discovery of the South African gold fields and the discovery of the cyanide process for extracting gold from low grade or great ores. And gold went from being a deflationary metal to being an inflationary metal. Not very, not very, I mean, it, it, it's still relatively stable compared to what you can do with fiat money. But nonetheless, the market value of gold was going down, not up, and therefore the free silver movement was no longer a politically viable movement. Uh, so, so in that sense, uh, a commodity isn't perfectly stable. No, my preferred commodity system, which I've written about a long time ago, is a commodity bundle. That is, from my standpoint, the ideal currency is not is neither a cryptocurrency nor any of these things. It's competing private issuers, and they are issuing a fractional reserve banks where they guarantee to redeem their their money for a collection of commodities. So you say, if you bring in a million Friedman dollars to my bank, you get 400 pounds of grade two steel, uh, 73 bushels of wheat, two ounces of gold, some list of commodities, which is chosen to be roughly the equivalent of a price index. So that it is unlikely that the price of the total bundle that the value of the total bundle in terms of what it can buy is going to change very much. And you would then have a system that was more stable. That is the trouble with a single commodity is that something can happen that greatly changed its value. And gold has done pretty well. Silver has done pretty well. But actually, if you, if you look at, at both gold and silver, uh, their exchange value has gone up a lot in my lifetime. Well, that makes them a bad money. Because it means that if you're doing, making contracts, if you can't predict it, if you could predict it, it would be fine. If you can't predict it, it means if you're making contracts in that money, if I borrow money, I risk having my debt go up tenfold as the value of the money goes up, which is why a commodity bundle would be better. So I, I would have said that my ideal system, and I have, if, if you're curious, the, I have an old article, which is on the Cato site somewhere, called something like gold paper, uh, gold paper, something, I forget what it is. Uh, and it's a discussion of alternative monetary systems. And my basic argument is that the real issue is not what your is not what the currency is defined in. The real issue is what are the incentives for the people controlling it? And that the advantage of the competing private issuers is that they have an incentive to maintain the value of their money, because if they don't, people will use somebody else's money. And uh, therefore, with uh, the way to do that is a a hundred percent reserve system is very inefficient and very expensive. Uh, so the sensible way to do that is to have a fractional reserve system in which the bank has positive assets, but most of those are interest bearing assets, and it has maybe five percent or ten percent of the amount of currency out in the actual commodity. Uh, you wouldn't even need that much in the case of my commodity bundle because that's a pretty safe one. Uh, and then anybody, they, they won't, they won't exchange anything less than a million dollars in my version because of the nature of the bundle, but that's enough. So that if the value of the currency gets below the value of the commodity bundle, people will come in and, 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 and take them up on it. If the value of the currency gets above the value of the commodity bundle, it's in the bank's interest to print more money. And that's going to hold the price predictably uh, at, 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 a, at a reasonably fixed value. So that's the ideal system. Now that's separate from the mechanics of how you make it a digital system. That's just from an economist standpoint, uh, what I think the right monetary system is going to be. Hmm. Uh, how about these, these store of value attributes? So somebody, people would say, you know, gold is gold because it has certain attributes that make it a good store of value versus something Sometimes uh, like sand or, you know, between, between 19, my guess, I'd, I'd have to look at the numbers, but roughly between 1900 and 1940, I think it was a poor store of value. I think, I think if you check, I, I may be, I may be wrong. It's not my but, field. But, but do you think it, 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 it has attributes that make it a good store of value or do you think it's just, well, it's, I mean, what does that mean? The thing is it's, <laughs> it's value depends partly on both on supply and demand. And it, it, it is true that it has the at attribute that it is hard to supply very much of it. That is to say that the right. total world stock of gold is large compared to the amount mined each year. 
On the other hand, the demand could stable, could change quite a lot. If when it was a monetary commodity, that gave you a demand. Uh, nowadays, there's sometimes a speculative demand, which can go up and down. Uh, it's got an industrial demand, which can go up and down. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's not bad. Uh, and, but I would have said that the real advantages of gold and silver historically, gold especially, is that it has a very high value to weight uh, ratio. And therefore, you can carry money around with you. Yeah. It's really hard if you're using steel as your moderate commodity. And gold in particular is pretty easy to test because gold until modern times was the densest known material. You can measure density pretty easily. Uh, it's got other characteristics which are a bit unusual. It's very malleable and, and, and so forth. So that meant that as if you were going to use a coin system, if, if you use actual coins, which until modern days is what much most most money was, uh, then gold made a lot of sense. But I wouldn't say it's any better than other other things. And its disadvantage is that it, it, it isn't interest bearing. Whereas mm -hmm. if your store of value is land that you're growing stuff on. Uh, but you, or, you don't think it's, well, it is better than, right? Because it does have those certain attributes, right? It's it's dense, like you're saying. It's, uh, that makes it a, a very good a very good thing. Fungible, for every unit equals every other unit. That makes it very uh, good for coinage. It's hard to copy. Um, but it's, but we don't, it's, it, it's hard to forge. Right. But, but we don't use coins very much nowadays. And... Most of those other attributes, uh, you know, if what you have is uh, a warehouse full of steel, uh, it's true it takes up a bit more space, but still uh, steel lasts just fine if you, you know, keep it in suitable circumstances. Uh, steel is also useful stuff. Grain is useful. You can eat grain. You can't eat uh, gold. So I don't think, I don't think it's, I mean, you know, gold has historically been important, as has silver, but I don't think there's a reason in the modern world why gold has a special value that other assets don't have. I guess what I was trying to get at, because I, or lead, lead you to, which you're not allowing me to, I guess for good reason, is, uh, you know, that that's what Bitcoin and Monero try to mimic digitally, right? So have, they having, don't. Well, yeah. having these attributes, so, you know, Every unit equals, and I and I think obviously I, I, I think see. Monero does this better than Bitcoin. Right. Uh, you know, so it's fungible. For example, every yeah, unit yeah. equals every other unit. Yes, that's it's, true. It's digitally scarce. You know, it can't be uh, created uh -huh. or copied. Um, yes, and it it is true that it has a roughly constant quantity. Uh, I don't know how Monero works. That uh, yeah, it has a it has a uh, a known rate, and it's Bitcoin a, has a right. increasing quantity, but it's still small compared to the total stock at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's still but but the but the problem is even compared to gold, the only use that Bitcoin or Monero has is as money, and that means, especially since there are substitutes, if people decide that. Uh, Zcash is better than Monero. You could have your, your the value of the Monero could crash. If Monero turns out to be a really wonderfully good uh, digital currency, the value of Bitcoin could crash. So I don't think it's all that stable in terms of in terms of, of value. I mean, if it it seems to me that. But is isn't, isn't that just like the competition between gold and and steel and these other things where, that, where the market is slowly learning which one is the best form of digital money? Except that gold's demand is not only monetary demand. That that gold- But wouldn't that, wouldn't that be even more ideal though, if that is the only use case? No, if it's only be because monetary demand, given that there are substitutes, can fluctuate enormously. Whereas the demand of gold for jewelry, for electrical contacts, it's got a bunch of, of real world functions. Now, it's gold is still more stable, more unstable than most commodities, I would guess, because the speculative demand really more than money doesn't have much monetary demand at this nowadays. Uh, but uh, but I would have thought that as a store of value, wheat's probably better than gold. It's probably more predictable what its value will be in the future. Uh, but it so, can be. be can decay. It's hard. It's harder. Right. It's not going to last. Yeah. yeah. Right. You have to have it properly stored and such. And, right. and you can presumably sell your wheat each year and buy more wheat and so forth. But, 
All I'm saying is I don't see, I realize that a lot of people have a sentimental fondness for gold. And I like gold. It's pretty stuff. One of my hobbies is making jewelry. And I wish gold were cheaper because mostly I use silver because gold's too expensive to, to be willing to do stuff out of. Uh, but, uh, but I, but I, I don't think that, you know, either gold, I don't think as a store of value that digital currency is particularly good because it's, it's what you'd like. And it's certainly not a good thing to make contracts in. Again, because you can't predict its future value, and I would have said the great virtue of 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 uh, cryptocurrency, the two great virtues are a, it can be relatively private, and b, it gives you in principle an easy way of making transactions by sending messages. Hmm. Uh, now, PayPal does that, uh, Visa does that in effect also, uh, but this does it in a way in which you it is at least much harder for other people to know what you're doing, and a lot of people. Uh, would rather have people not know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to often describe it as as free speech money. So it's it's kind of an I ideal mm -hmm. form of money uh, or or even speech, right? So it's 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 censorship resistant. It's mm -hmm. essentially a, like you said, a means of communication, and it's currently being used for communicating value, but in a way where I can send you peer to peer without censorship, without anybody knowing how much I sent you or yeah. who's involved in the transaction. What what is your take on that? In and you know, so theoretically, if that is true, and it and it can actually perform that function better than anything else, and it it, it comes to that fruition. Uh, do you think that that's ultimately a good thing? And so oh, it's, a good, it's, a, it's, it's a good thing. How important it is in terms of the market, I'm not sure. That is, mm. let me go back a bit. I've been, I'd have to look, but I've probably been writing about public key encryption since, oh, I don't know, maybe the 1980s or so, something like that. I'd have to check when I first wrote about it, Amazing. but I never encrypt anything. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, some things are automatically encrypted by the software, but I, my emails, I've never, never, never bothered to encrypt my email because mm -hmm. I don't have a whole lot of secrets. I mean, the, I like to say that when you're young, you're afraid people will steal your ideas. When you're old, you're afraid they won't. <laughs> so, and I suspect that although lots of people talk about privacy as an important thing, that not a lot of people are willing to go to a lot of trouble in order to keep their privacy. Uh, indeed, one of the things that occasionally surprises me about what I guess I think of as the younger generation, which is I, up to say sometime in their 40s maybe, uh, since I'm fairly old at this point, is how willing they are to make their lives public. That I remember being a little bit shocked with regard to my older son about the amount of stuff he put up on the web about his life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wouldn't, uh, but I think, I think a lot of people most of the time don't mind living, living a fairly public life. Now there are obviously some context. If you're engaged in illegal transactions, obviously it would be nice to have a, a, a cryptocurrency to do it in. Uh, maybe if you're engaged in tax evasion, it might be useful, which is an illegal transaction, of course, as well. Uh, there are probably a few other contexts, but I would have guessed that of all the messages that people are sending sort of each day, that 98% of them, they don't care if they're private or not. And that of all purchases, probably 90 or something between 90 and 98%, they don't really care if they're private or not. I don't really care if anybody knows what I bought from Amazon in the last two days or whatever. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I think the... I'm in favor of it. I think the world is a better place if people can do that because in general, I think that governments, I want governments to be constrained not by what they're allowed to do, which doesn't work very well, but why what they can do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's an important distinction people often don't make. Uh, and, but I think actually of, of public key encryption is a more important thing for that than, than cryptocurrency that, that I had a, a, it was a debate or a conversation with somebody prominent uh, that's up on the web somewhere, uh, someone on the right prominent, Ed Meese, in fact, uh, in which I was arguing that public key encryption was the modern equivalent of the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That the point of the Second Amendment is that if people have guns, that right. limits the ability of the government to control them. Right. Uh, 
And now I should say to prevent tyranny, essentially, that's not really fair. I don't think I, I think I think the original reason is a little more complicated. Than that. I think it's connected to that. But but I think that the and the original reason doesn't work, unfortunately, anymore. I think people in the 18th century were seriously worried about professional armies. If you think about the history of England in the 17th century, you have two civil wars. The first civil war is parliament against the king. And parliament wins via the new model army commanded by Oliver Cromwell. The second civil war is Oliver Cromwell and the new model army against everybody else and he wins with the result that England was a military dictatorship for about 14 years until Cromwell died. He was probably one of the better English rulers, I think. Uh, I mean, dictatorship is not a normative term, but it was a reason for people to be worried about the dangers of the professional army, because it looked as though on the one hand, professional armies were good for winning wars, but they were dangerous for seizing power. And my interpretation of the Second Amendment was that their solution to that problem was you have a very small professional army and a very large militia. And half of that is that uh, the large militia makes it possible to have a small professional army because it means that even though the militia isn't as good as the professional army, there's lots of it. So if you have to fight a war, you've got lots of people, even if they're not very well-trained people. But the other half is that if the professional army tries to seize power, they're outnumbered 100 to one. And I think that was the original theory. And I don't think that works very well anymore because it, given modern technology, a militia really is not much of a substitute for a professional army if you end up fighting another country. Uh, but I think the modern version, as I see it, is, is the argument that people make that it makes tyranny harder. And that doesn't work very well now either because the difference between uh, military weapons and civilian weapons has gotten much larger than it was in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that unregulated public key encryption provides the modern equivalent because modern conflicts between the government and citizens are likely to be largely information warfare. That the reason, the, the way the government oppresses you, at least in a country like the US, is by controlling what you know, not by actually shooting people. The shooting people is a fairly small part of it. And from my standpoint, the nice thing about widespread use of public key encryption is now that you can have not only conversations, but reputations, which aren't linked to real space identities, and therefore it's the government can't control. I, I wrote about this a long time. I've got an old article you can find on my web page called A World of Strong Privacy. I'm not sure it's going to happen, but it did seem to me that that's, from, 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 from my standpoint as a libertarian, Cryptocurrency is very nice, but widespread use of uh, public key encryption would be more important. Yeah, I, I guess my, my response to that would be, uh, you know, cryptocurrency, you know, uh, cryptocurrency is, is creating the incentive mechanism for that to actually exist. So I, I'm actually I'm running for Congress uh, in New York. And so a part of uh, my message is and on know, which, on which party do you expect to nominate you? Uh, I've been nominated by the Republican Party. I just won my primary Good for you. Uh, by seventy-five percent to twenty. Well, actually, all the all the absentee ballots haven't been counted yet. This, so is, I, I this is the to... this is the district where the Democrats get eighty percent of the vote, right? No, this is a district where the Democrats normally normally win. Um, yeah. but yeah, which may be why there was less competition for the you know. right, right. So, but so you know, I, I, you I've in? been nominated. Where, where in New York are you? The Congressional Fourth District. So I'll be yes. running against uh, Kathleen Rice. It's Nassau County. I don't know if you're familiar with Long Island, but it's, yeah, it's a little. pretty much three quarters of Nassau County. So right outside of New York City. So it's you know not that other districts aren't relevant, but it's it's a it's a very. Well, I suppose you're going to claim like somebody else I knew there that the Outer Bridge Crossing is actually named after somebody called Outer Bridge. <laughs> the obvious explanation is it's the Outer Bridge, uh, but. Right. Yeah. The point, the point, well, I guess what I was trying to say, so part of my, met, one, one part of my, met, yeah. being a cryptocurrency person yeah. and a Monero person is that I think, you know, the importance of cryptocurrency is basically what you were saying is <laughs> that it will preserve liberty, help us preserve liberty in the digital age without essentially relying on the government to do that, yes. preserving it for us. It's creating technology 
that will help us preserve that, it without relying on government. That, that's so, true, but it won't do very much of that, unfortunately. Well, I guess my, my point that I would try to make in response yeah. to you is say, so the private key, public key thing is is very important, but crypto is is the incentive model that it's allowed that to take off in a decentralized way. So instead of relying on companies like Zoom or WhatsApp or Facebook or whoever to add this encryption to their services, uh, you know, Monero is doing it in a decentralized way that's not controlled by any company. And as more people use it and onboard to it, it's becoming its its own animal that can't be stopped. And you're not basically waiting, asking for the permission of a company to do something. But, but what you what can you do with it other than make payments? Well, you know, it could be it could kind of becoming layer one of this of this new internet, right? This kind of this more decentralized version of the internet itself. Uh, the the initial incentive is is it's it's fueled by by money, right? So that's why people are mining, and that's why people are sent currently sending messages. But there's no reason why you know further apps can't be built on top of it, and then it's done in in a way that essentially can't be stopped. You know, it's not like you know. Uh, Facebook adds encryption one day, and then the next day you learn that it created a backdoor. Um, but so it seems I, to that me that my, my response to why I think cryptocurrency is so important, not just yes. private key, public key encryption. Because I would have said that what you really need is a world where everybody has got a private key and uses mechanisms to make his public key public. Uh, and that's sort of a chicken and egg problem, because if other people aren't doing it, it's not worth your doing it. And if only a handful of people do it, they're sort of marking themselves for the potential opponents. Uh, right. So, and I just, I don't see how, how one arrow is going to get you there. I mean, it would certainly, it's useful. I mean, when I, as I when I discussed this, this stuff a long, long time ago, one of the pieces was an anonymous digital currency. But that's only one of the pieces, and I don't think that by it's that. It nice I, think, I think it's driven. It's driven by greed, and that's what's fueling yeah, sure. the onboarding of it, which uh -huh. is allowing it to to naturally grow. It's why people are deciding to use it. You know, they want the value of their Monero to go up. But, um, but how do you how do you how do you use Monero to make to offer an argument to people? To offer an argument to people, I want to I I want to be able to argue for some conclusion in a way such that the, such that nobody else knows who I am making the argument, mm. but that having made many arguments, I kind of established a reputation as being an interesting, intelligent person. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you're you're just talking about, that, you know, uh, I, I, right, right. So that, that would be an, you know, an app built on top of the, you know, the Monero uh, blockchain, right? So there's, there's other technologies. Uh, there's one called Tari which may allow for things like that. Um, but basically, uh, yeah, you're, well, you're talking about this idea that you spoke about a while ago, right? So this identity, uh, this uh, digital identity reputation system, right? Mm -hmm. Where you could do it in an anonymous way. So I guess my argument, yeah, my, what I would say to that is that I see that as something, an app that may be built on top of something like Bitcoin or Monero. Uh, mm -hmm. And then it, it essentially can't be shut down because it's built on this distributed um, you know, platform. Mm -hmm. Um, but what, what do you think about, uh, I don't know if you heard or if you saw the, the lawful access to encrypted data act that they're talking about in no. Congress. So they're, they're currently trying to pass that right now, uh, basically mandating that back doors be created. People have been trying to do that for a very long time. Uh, that was the clipper chip, as you may remember, was an mm -hmm. early incarnation of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously I'm against it. And I don't know what the chances are that it'll happen. Uh, the the thing is that at the moment, the encryption is working when it's when it's built in, into the application or built into the the platform or whatever. But we don't have what we ought to have, which is end to end encryption, where people are doing it themselves. And that's a system which they really can't can't control. And that's been mm -hmm. the argument for a long time. But right. But. Uh, which is what we're yeah. Which which was what why I think cryptocurrency is so important because it could be that that platform that allows that to happen. Um, what do you think about? So we're seeing a lot of things about censorship right now, right? So I don't know if you heard, but uh, Reddit I think got rid of uh, one one of the Trump uh, Reddit pages. Yes, um, I get it. You know, we're seeing a lot of things in the news. You know, censorship happening on things like Twitter. 
-hmm. what's your what's your what are your thoughts there on on where we're currently at with that and where we may be headed and will something like cryptocurrency or these technologies we're talking about save the day potentially mm -hmm. uh I was just checking, by the way, I was wrong. It was the 1990s that I started writing about, about this stuff. Uh, the, yeah, uh, the particular one that I'm upset about at the moment, uh, which is not, which is related, it's not the same thing, is that as you may know, there was a very interesting blog called Slate Star Codex. Uh, and the blogger posted under a pseudonym and the New York Times decided to do an article on him and told him they were going to keep to, in the article to give his real name. And he had two reasons to be concerned about that. First, he's a psychiatrist. And I gather psychiatrists don't want their patients to know lots of stuff about them outside of the professional reputation relationship. And second, since some of the essays he's posted on Slate Star Codex are arguing against things that some people are strongly in favor of, there are people who don't like him, and I gather have been at least some death threats, and so he's worried about that. And Scott's response to the New York Times saying that was to shut down the blog, to simply delete it. And so far, the New York Times hasn't published the article. Uh, there's been a good deal of commentary on it uh, by me, by uh, Larry Lessig, uh, by a fair number of other people who are unhappy about it, Scott Aronson. But it's an interesting case in the sense that it was a place where you actually had conversations across a very wide range of views. I like to describe it as ranging from communists to anarcho-capitalists, from believing Catholics to atheists, from a literal rocket scientist to a literal plumber. And the conversation was almost all civil. So it was the only place I know of online where you actually had intelligent civil conversation across a long, a wide range of views. And it's gotten shut down. And it's gotten shut down uh, basically because doing anything that a significant number of people are very much against gets risky uh, because of the potential for literal attacks and and uh, cyber attacks and so forth. Uh, and I'm not sure there's much you can do about it. That is uh, one of the things I've wondered about and discussing with somebody a couple of days ago is whether if Scott at the beginning had really tried very hard to maintain his anonymity. In fact, he posts as Scott Alexander, which is in fact his first and middle name. It's his last name that isn't known. It isn't very hard to find out who he is. Uh, if you really make an effort to. And the New York Times obviously had no difficulty doing so. And I'm not sure whether in the world as it now is, if he had started, if, if he had realized when he started, this is a blog which probably has maybe 20,000 readers, 30,000 readers, something on that order, uh, which essays from which are occasionally quoted in major media because Scott's a very bright and original guy. He writes very well, it's interesting stuff. Uh, I don't think he anticipated that when he started it. And if he had, he could have done a better job of staying secret. But how good a job? I'm not at all sure that uh, yeah, at present. Uh, but I do think anonymity is important for maintaining a free speech environment. Uh, and encryption is one way of doing it, obviously. Uh, What's your response to people who would say, uh, uh, you know, that are, are fearful of, of, you know, pure free speech happening. So, you know, where, where, you know, they're fearful that misinformation gets, uh, you know, pro, you know, put out there and that, uh, happens you know, with happens speech that starts to spread virally. Yeah, um, but it's, it's, I, mean, I think the, you, you know, the answer as well as I do to that one, that if you don't have free speech, uh, information, misinformation also gets put out. It just doesn't get contradicted mm -hmm. in the, in the environment as it now is one of the skills that we, don't teach and largely anti-teach in our educational system is the ability to evaluate sources of information on internal evidence. That you rarely have enough time and effort when you read an essay arguing for something to figure out for yourself whether it's telling the truth by looking at other sources. Occasionally you do if it's really important. So what you need to do is to train yourself to say, this essay reads as though it's written by somebody who cares whether what he's saying is true 
this essay reads as though it's written by somebody who wants to persuade me of something. And, you know, you look for questions like, what are the strongest arguments against his position? Does he make them and respond to them? That's the kind of thing you see. Uh, and uh, the given that skill, then the internet is an obviously unfiltered medium. So you know anything you read on it could be a lie. And you then take as your first order by the internal evidence, does this sound like somebody, not necessarily who's right, but who can be trusted. And second, if it's important, can I find somebody else that ideally for anything important, before you believe an article arguing for something, you want to find the article that disagreed with it. Uh, and that's true of academic journal articles that people talk a lot about peer review. Peer review is a very, very weak filter as anybody who's really been involved in the system knows. Uh, so if somebody, one of the things that Scott's done a good deal of is analyzing academic articles and sometimes a whole bunch of them. One of the, one of the reasons I guess that got into New York Times interested is that very early in the coronavirus thing, he had, one of his posts was looking at the evidence on masks. And this is pre-coronavirus evidence on the effect of masks. And he concluded that it was reasonably clear that wearing face masks would significantly reduce the risk of transmitting it to somebody else, would probably mildly reduce the risk of getting it. Uh, at that point, the official position of the authorities was you shouldn't wear a mask. Eventually, they switched from you shouldn't to you must. Uh, but he, in fact, was well ahead of them. Uh, and he does a lot of that sort of stuff as well. He has a very... You, you can find the State Star Codex stuff archived, obviously. The, the blog itself isn't there anymore. Uh, and uh, he has a lot of interesting things. But certainly one of the points that gets very clear when you read him or if you're a professional academic is the fact that something is published in a respectable journal doesn't mean it's true. Uh, it's passed some filters, but not very strong filters. So do, do you think this is a problem that uh, society will, will overcome? So we'll, we'll all slowly become more skilled at this or? We will never always overcome it. Information is costly and especially information about things that aren't very valuable to you personally is likely to be very low quality. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to decide uh, whether you should eat a low carbohydrate diet, and you are sort of a inter really interested person who's seriously considering it, you have a pretty strong incentive to investigate the evidence for and against. But if you're deciding who to vote for, you know perfectly well that your vote is almost certain not to have any effect. So it makes very little sense to spend a lot of effort investigating the claims, and it makes a good deal of sense to say, what position will make me popular with my friends? What's it fun to believe in? And so forth and so on to do it on that basis. So I think you are not, never likely to have a future in which people are well informed about sort of public policy issues. Uh, you may have a future in which it's possible to be well informed, uh, but you're not actually going to be well informed. And then this gets into your, your book, Machinery of Freedom, right, where you talk about the privatization of things and how uh, that might be a, a more efficient way of, do, of doing everything, including yes. government itself, right? Yeah. Um, so do you think that's an eventuality? Is that, is that the direction we're Could heading? Be. Could be. I don't, I don't know. I'm, uh, prof I'm not good at prophecy. Uh, it, it's hard to prophesy, especially about the future, as somebody put it. Uh, are we getting I, close to, are we current in, in I, your time since you've written we're, it? We're always, moving, we're always moving in both directions at once. Okay. I think if you look at it, there are always some things that are getting better. The huge thing that went better was China ceasing to be a communist country. China is still not nearly as free as it ought to be. Uh, Hong Kong becoming part of China is a big step down. But if you think about how large the step is, China at this point is a non-democratic country that is not a lot less capitalist than the U.S., uh, it depends where you are in China, but I think Shanghai, which I visited and enjoyed quite a lot, doesn't feel less capitalist than, than a U.S. city. Uh, other places may. Uh, and going to there from what they had under Mao was just an enormous improvement, and it's a huge population. Uh, more generally, I think the third world finally got through to them 
that countries that relied mostly on the market were doing much better than countries that were trying to develop by central planning. The collapse of the Soviet Union was a large part of that, but other things as well. So that's a way in which things are getting much better, I think. At the same time, the, the way I like to put it is that on the one hand, socialism in the old sense is largely dead. That is to say, the idea, which was a very persuasive idea, that if only you had an intelligent person running things, you could run an economy much better than this disorganized market system. And that was not an absurd idea, but it wasn't true. And I don't, you know, I'm sure there are people who believe it, but I don't think it, that, that that has the kind of strength that it had when I was a college student. At the same time, unfortunately, environmentalism has replaced it. And in one way, that's an improvement because environmentalism is a better argument. That is to say, there really are externalities. On the other hand, we don't have a very good way of deciding what environmental policies will really make us better off or worse off. Uh, it's a decision being made mostly by the government. From the standpoint of the individual, you have very inc little incentive to do it because most of the effects are on other people. Uh, governments are likely to make very large mistakes in, in, in that regard. Uh, I suppose the biggest environmental policy that the U.S. government has at this point is trying to make people hungry in the third world, which you do by converting a large fraction of the corn produced by the largest corn producer in the world into alcohol, thus driving up the price of corn, which is an important food stuff. As far as I can tell, the evidence is that does nothing at all for the environment, that the that was the argument for it. But as far as I can tell, the conclusion eventually uh, was that uh, turning corn into alcohol costs as much CO2 in the process of growing and processing the corn uh, as it as it saves in terms of replacing gasoline. Uh, and uh, Gore, I think, at some point admitted that the reason he was in favor of it was that he was running for president and the primary was in Iowa and farmers like having their products expensive, obviously. Uh, so, so I think it's a case where there is a legitimate argument for government intervention, but there aren't governments that have the incentives and the ability to actually make the right interventions. And I think that's been true. I mean, one of the really extraordinary things, if you look about the whole glo global warming situation, is the countries that are most enthusiastic about preventing global warming are the countries that are going to, that are going to benefit by it, all right? If, if the temperature of the globe goes up by, you know, three degrees centigrade or so, what, the size of Canada doubles. I don't know if it literally doubles, but Canada is basically this very thin strip where its northern border is where it's too cold to do stuff. The temperature contours are going to move towards the pole and Canada becomes a much larger country. There, I, I don't think there's any serious doubt that Canada will benefit by global warming, but Canada's the Canadian government is pushing hard against it. Ditto for Scandinavia. The only country I can think of that's behaving sensibly from that standpoint is Russia, that Putin claims he doesn't believe in global warming. And my suspicion is he does believe it. He's looked at a map and he realizes that a lot more of Russia is cold than hot and that <laughs> therefore on net they benefit by it. Uh, so... Meanwhile, uh, India, which is one of the countries that actually is potentially at risk because they're a place where a good deal of it is hot enough so a little hotter you can't live there anymore, continues to build coal plants with abandon. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so, so I think it's, it's a, uh, a case where you have a pretty good argument for government intervention, but like most of these arguments, it depends on assuming that governments do the right things and there is very little reason to expect them to. And therefore, the government becomes sort of a, a random creator of chaos, as it were, uh, by intervening in things which often make the world better, world worse rather, rather than better. Uh, so anyway, so all I'm saying is that things are getting better and worse at the same time in different dimensions. And How about in America itself? What, what's your, what's your kind of take Ooh, on America right. right now? Well, at the moment, they're looking terrible, but I'm not sure if that's just a temporary effect of people going crazy because of being locked up for a month or whatever, or whether it's a long-term shift. I mean, at the moment, it looks as though being against racism is being used as an excuse for generally sort of leftish pushes. And one theory, the pessimistic theory, is that this is the final result of the left having controlled the universities for so long. And I was generally optimistic on the theory that college students generally don't believe what their professors teach them anyway. Uh, 
but it certainly has been the case that for quite a while you've had a political monoculture in a good deal of the university system, and that's a disturbing fact. Uh, and maybe that's finally, you know, surfaced. And now there are so many people who've been taught a lot of largely mistaken stuff uh, that, that 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 is becoming politically influential. But the alternative, as I say, is just that that the effect of the uh, of the pandemic was that a lot of people were under a lot of strain, and now you can get out and do something. It isn't exciting having a demonstration. Uh, do, do you think the free market in America is is healthy enough to to solve these problems, or did, well, you, are you uh, which problem? fearful that we've kind of reached a point of no return? Well, because I mean, I, well, there, there's a story about Adam Smith that after I think it may have been the Battle of Saratoga, one of the battles that the uh, Americans won in the in the Revolutionary War that when the news gets to Scotland, one of Smith's students comes to him and says, Mr. Smith, this will be the ruin of England. And Smith replies, young man, there's a lot of ruin in a nation. And I think that's true of the US too, that in that sense, you know, for a while I was very optimistic back during the dot-com boom when things seemed to be all going the right direction. Now they're sort of swinging back the wrong direction, but uh, I don't think, uh, my son pointed out to me that probably we can, if we wish, get Hungarian citizenship uh, on the grounds that my father's mother not only was born in what was then Austro-Hungary, uh, but somebody we know can document the fact. And apparently Hungary, like a number of other countries, has the position that if one of your ancestors provably was a citizen, it's a little bit odd for Hungary to think of Austro-Hungary as being a citizen, because I don't think where they were is where they, I think, I think where my paternal ancestors came from is now in Ukraine, <laughs> but it was in Austro-Hungary. And apparently that means if I wanted, I could get Hungarian citizenship. And apparently the U.S. now allows dual citizenship. It used to be very much down on that. And it's a little bit tempting, but I don't really think the chances that I'm going to want someplace to run are, are that high uh, at the moment. Are there any particular policies that you see America practically possibly adopting that could help push us closer towards your worldview of what sure. you like that is the, the, the obvious one is spreading of voucher plans for education that uh in general uh the u.s k-12 through system is the largest socialist enterprise in the u.s i think larger than the military i'm not sure uh and it doesn't do a very good job it has some tendency towards ideological bias, given that the school teachers are coming out of that same university system. And it does not have a very good tendency to teach people useful things and how to think well and so forth. And I think if you had a seriously competitive K through 12 market, which you would have if you had vouchers available at something close to the full expenditure per student of, of, of the present public schools, you would then have a competitive market. In that competitive market, I think you would get a substantial improvement in the quality of education. And I think that would be a significant improvement. That's, I suppose, the other thing that might happen would be legalizing marijuana. I don't think we're going to end the war on drugs entirely, which of course is what ought to happen in my view. But I think that drug laws have been one thing that have promoted uh, government power in undesirable fashion. I think a whole lot of this talk about misdeeds of the police is due to things that wouldn't happen if we didn't have a war on drugs, uh, that things like SWAT teams and no-knock raids and so forth, I think are all side effects of the war on drugs. And, uh, you know, I think where the Black Lives Matter, et cetera, people are wrong is in assuming it's about blacks, that in fact, uh, it's not at all clear that the police are more oppressive to blacks than to whites. Uh, if you look at the data, it's true that the percentage of blacks killed by the police is larger than the percentage of whites, although the total numbers, of course, are larger for whites. There being much, many more whites. But then the percentage of blacks who kill other blacks is also much higher. And you can see the higher the crime rate is, uh, the higher, more likely the police are to get involved. But what is clear is that police quite often behave very badly 
uh, and that's a problem for both blacks and whites, and it would be nice to do something about it. And despite all the talk at the moment, I think the thing most likely to do something about it would be uh, eliminating part or all of the war on drugs, because that's what's really driving it. But unfortunately, that's not what people are demonstrating for. Right. How about the lockdown itself? What, what, what was your, your thought on that, the fact that we completely shut down the economy? Well, uh, we personally locked down before the state did. That basically, in March, I was on a speaking trip in Europe. And my younger son emailed me arguing I should cancel the trip and come home because of the spreading uh, virus. And my initial reaction was not to. Uh, and then I thought about it for a while. And I had seen an example in the past of an intelligent elderly man not responding to an unusual danger until he actually saw it himself. And it seemed to me that that was a pattern that's explained by the distinction between crystallized intelligence and fluid intelligence. Crystallized intelligence, fluid intelligence is seeing a problem and figuring out the answer. Crystallized intelligence is seeing a problem and applying the answer you figured out last time. The older you are, the more you shift towards crystallized intelligence, partly because you've got less time to get the benefit of new thinking and partly because you've got more answers from the past. And that it, that's often a sensible decision, but it's not a sensible decision when you're facing something new. And I concluded that I was making the same mistake that I had observed in someone else in the past, that because I'd done lots of speaking trips, I'd never faced anything like this coronavirus, so I just sort of dismissed it. And that thinking about it, I decided my son was right, so I canceled my last two talks. In fact, one of them would have had to be done in Slovenia, but not to a live audience. By that time they decided, and the other was going to be in Prague, and I wouldn't have been able to get to Prague. It turned out that they closed the border after I made the decision, but before I would have arrived. And I flew home. So I got home on March 13th. I have been farther than 10 feet from my own property only once since then, uh, when I went for some medical tests that my doctor wanted me to have of no great importance. but. Uh, and in general, my whole family has been doing a fairly tight self-quarantine. Uh, but I guess my best guess of the rights response to the situation was for the people who are most vulnerable, which include, I, I'm both old and male. One of the things, by the way, that nobody is talking about is that the men are substantially more likely to die of coronavirus than women. Mm -hmm. If you look at the data for, Silicon, for, for, for Santa Clara County, where I live, it's about 50%. The, the number who, number of cases is about the same and the number of deaths is about 50% higher. Uh, I saw figures for the UK a fair while ago and it was almost twice as high. So people, it's sort of what's fashionable to worry about and what isn't fashionable to worry about. But in any case, I'm both old and male. Uh, my wife is a little less old and female, but we're both at significant risk. Uh, so, and we can afford it, that you can get groceries delivered. I'm retired. Uh, my daughter's profession is online uh, freelance editor, so she doesn't have to go out of the house. Uh, my younger son is a would-be writer. He doesn't have to come out of the house. Uh, so we've basically mostly locked down. Uh, but, but as far as I could, I mean, presumably the original theory was that by the lockdown, you could actually get the effect of herd immunity that is drive the total number of virus down to close to zero. It didn't happen. And if it wasn't going to happen, I'm not sure there was much point to it, that what you really want to do is to keep the number of people infected down to the level that the hospital system can handle, exactly. and then just keep going till you reach herd immunity. And, right. I don't, and, and, and during that time, insofar as possible, vulnerable people should quarantine. Uh, and that didn't really happen. Uh, and that's more or less what Sweden was trying to do, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. And Sweden has had more deaths per capita than the other Scandinavian countries, fewer than the U.S. last time I looked at the numbers. But it's not really clear if that's more deaths or just deaths coming sooner. Mm -hmm. uh, so there have been a few places. New Zealand did very well. Taiwan did very well. A few places which actually managed to, by taking fairly strong methods, get it to close to zero. And that's fine if you can, if you can get away with it. Part of the cost is that they don't let that foreigners come in anymore, and they won't for a fair while.
but it may may have been the right decision for them. But as far as I can tell, for the U.S., the lockdown didn't do what it was supposed to do. Uh, that with, except for maybe New York and maybe New Orleans, I'm not sure. I don't think there has been anywhere yet where the hospital system was at capacity. That uh, so, and that's the only the only thing that you really gain as far as I can tell, unless, you know, if you believe that we're going to solve the problem next week, then, then, then you want to keep people alive as best you can. But I don't think we are. I think we're going to, we are going to get a little better at curing it over time. We've had a little bit of progress in that, but nothing very, very radical. Uh, and uh, the, so I guess, I guess probably the right strategy was to encourage social distancing to encourage vulnerable people to isolate, uh, but not to actually lock down. Uh, now, maybe it may have made sense to lock down environments where you had very large numbers of people getting together, but but a sort of more general lockdown, I think, was over was was being overdone. Uh, but I'm certainly not an expert in that. I mean, it's not something where I've certainly I've paid attention to it because it matters to me, uh, but not beyond that. I, I definitely, I definitely we put your analysis there. there. Um, um, I'm getting a little echo here. I guess I'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. I'll just bring it back to, to crypto for right. the last question. So I saw in one of your talks um, where you were talking about your book, Future Imperfect, and you kind of envisioned two possible future scenarios uh, with encryption. One being a world where, like we're saying, you know, so like a Monero world where freedom of speech, uh, free speech is kind of... Uh, Perfect, perfect and ideal, and mm -hmm. uh, we live in this in this world where we can't be censored. And the other version being, uh, you know, this trans perfectly transparent world where we're constantly being tracked and traced. Um, any opinion there on on which? Well, the, the point I made there is that you might get both of them. That is, you okay. might get David Brin's transparent society in real space at the same time that you got something close to my world of strong privacy online. Uh, and then the crucial question is how well you can control the interface. That if you have, for people who haven't read Rin's book, Transparent Society, the, I think the first chapter or two are very good. Beyond that, I didn't find the book that persuasive, but, it's, but, he, but he makes some very important points. And in one respect, he was right and I was wrong because he was arguing that the uh, closest thing to a protection in a transparent society is having the transparency go in both directions so that the cops can watch us, but we can watch the cops. And my reaction to that was if the surveillance system is controlled by the cops, they can make sure that when they beat somebody up, the video camera is broken. And furthermore, but it turned out in fact, that the surveillance system wasn't controlled by the cops. The surveillance system consisted of the video camera everybody had in his pocket as part of his cell phone. And therefore, I think it is true that surveillance is on net making us more free, not less free so far, uh, but but also less private. I think that part is, is true. And uh, at the same time, we've got a good deal of anonymity online, though not nearly as much as I'd like. And we could move to more if if people more people find it worth using public key encryption, or if you're right that Monero can, or, or other cryptocurrencies can, can do it. But again, the world is always moving in in, in all directions at once. It's, it's not as simple as as things are getting good or things. And that that's always been true. Let me go back a step. Adam Smith, writing in the 18th century, discusses possible taxes. He rejects. I think both an income tax and a sales tax as unworkable because they would require a loss of privacy that no free people would put up with. That's an almost a literal quote, not exactly that, 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 that you would have to have an inquiry renewed every year into what people were doing and they wouldn't put up with that. Well, we now take it for granted. So that's a respect in which we were better off in the 18th century. At the same time, there are many other ways. In the 18th century, there was still chattel slavery, uh, lots of other ways in which things were worse off. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think you very often talk about that, right? The fact that it, it is very difficult to predict things, especially complicated systems. And yes. because of that, we shouldn't really take, take uh, actions uh, based on predictions necessarily, right? 
Well, you sometimes have no choice, right? But things like global, like uh, global warming, right? So being fearful. Global warming, warming is warming a, without the, 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 part of the reason in the case of global warming is that the series effects are quite long term. Mm -hmm. uh, that you can predict next year a lot better than you can predict next century. Right. But uh, to take very drastic measures without really yeah. knowing what the outcome yeah. may be. But, but in, in that case, though, it seems to me the other the other mistake in the in the current orthodoxy is that it pays attention only to the negative effects. And if you really think through global warming, it's not at all clear it's a bad thing. It's clear it will have some bad consequences. It will have some good consequences. Uh, it will increase the amount of land usable by humans because the loss due to sea level rise is much smaller than the gain due to cold areas getting livable. It will increase crop yields by a lot because CO2 is an input to photosynthesis. That's very well established by experiment because people do it in greenhouses all the time. The IPCC is envisaging roughly doubling CO2 concentrations by the end of the century. That gives you an increase of 30% in the yield of most food crops. That's a big effect. The negative effects on food crops are very uncertain. There might, they might exist. You're changing the environment in various ways. On the other hand, people currently grow crops across a very wide range of climates. A change that takes a century to occur, you've got lots of time to adjust. Uh, so on the other hand, there could be one of the things that we don't really know much about is the effect on the ocean of the pH going down. Well, they, people call it acidification, which is a little misleading because the ocean is basic. So it's really neutralization. It's the ocean becoming less basic than it was. But everything in it is adapted to the present environment, and we don't know how big the negative effects will be of that change. That's one of the things difficult to predict, and there are probably others. So I guess my view is there's no reason to be, there's no particular reason to expect the net effects to be negative, but they might be. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to take expensive precautions against something that might be an improvement. Uh, anyway. Well, I, th I think we covered a lot. Thank you. Thank uh -huh. you. I mean, I could talk to you. That's first. quite all right. Thank you, uh, David. Really appreciate you taking the time. And, uh, and good luck in your election. Thank I'm you. Sir. I can't vote for you. <laughs> That's Wrong okay. state. Bye bye. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye bye. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.